facing for sinners death on the cross that he might save them from endless loss blessed redeemer precious redeemer see now i see him on calvary's tree wounded and bleeding for sinners bleeding blinded and bleeding dying for me chapter 4 we'll begin with verse 31 and go down through verse 42 I want to speak to you about gathering the harvest this morning John chapter 4 beginning with verse 31 in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all to ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon you bestow no labor, other men labored, and you are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Gather the harvest. Father, we drive down the road and we see the fields that are white unto harvest. We live every day of our life, Lord, looking upon a harvest. But the sad truth is, is that many times we don't see the harvest that's right there before us. 
We don't see the lostness of souls. We don't see the lives of people that when they come to the end are not going to heaven but are going back into destruction into the lake of far for eternity. God, you called for reapers. But we as the Christian community around the world have not done a good job. We must confess, Father, that we have failed you in so many ways. Yes, we make an effort. But our, our effort is feeble compared to the amount of the harvest that is out there and the readiness of the harvest to be reaped. God, I pray that you would speak to each of us this day and help us to understand what your word is teaching us and why we are here. What our work really truly is above everything else. This is, this is the matter of life. So we ask in your name. Amen. I started pastoring when I was 18 years old. Two months, I'll be 78. That's 60 years. You know what? In all the years of pastoring, I have never came to a church, gone to a church that said, we want to grow. I have never, never went to a church that said, we want to grow, and then got right in and jumped in and went to it. Just didn't happen. Never has happened. So many churches want to be comfortable. We want to come to church. We want to sing the songs. We want to fellowship. We want to hear a good sermon. And then preacher, we want to go home and get back to life as we live it. Is that what God intends for us? I think maybe I might have disturbed some of you when I first came. <clears throat> because when I first came, I hit growth pretty hard. One of those messages had to deal with some churches. Remember three churches? But it was the church in Acts chapter 2 that growed. Why did they grow? Because they understood their purpose and they went forth to apply the message God had given them. Growth doesn't just happen. It doesn't just come about. It has to be focused upon and it has to be applied effort to gather the harvest. The farmers have got their fields planted. They've come to that moment ripe and ready. But if they didn't get out there with a combine, it would soon falter and come to the ground and be absorbed in the ground and be totally wasted. That's the way it is with so many lives in the world in which we live. The harvest, Jesus said, is ripe and ready. As we think about gathering the harvest, let's think about the physical versus the spiritual concerns. If you have your Bible, look at verses 31 to 36. 
You know that this is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well and Jesus. We're just looking at the latter part of that overall story this morning. And like the disciples, so many of us in the Christian community around the world are often focused upon the physical. You recall that the disciples had gone into town to get some things to eat. They were all hungry and Jesus was weary, as the Bible says, and he sat down at the well and, yes, he understood that something was going to happen. Somebody was coming by and that perhaps above everything else was his real purpose for waiting at the well. He knew that woman was coming. And he would have the opportunity to encounter that woman with the gospel message. And he knew the results. So the disciples had gone into the local village and they were there to gather up some food supplies that they might have something to eat and they came back and here is Jesus talking to some woman and they didn't care about that woman at all. They said, Jesus, we got the food, let's eat. <laughs> I suppose maybe they were hungry too. They were focused upon the physical, wasn't they? They'd gone to buy lunch and when they came back, they bid him to eat because they were hungry. The focus of the disciples was upon the physical nourishment that they desired, they wanted. They had no mind about the woman and her spiritual needs. Their focus was not on that. It was upon the physical things. You know, in life, we get so focused on the physical things of living, do we not? Hmm? Do we not? We do not concentrate on a world that is lost in sin. We so often don't even give thought to the world right around us. We just go home and change our clothes as Christians all over the world and we go right back into the movement of the pattern of life as we know and live it. Go back a page and look at John 3, 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God sent his son into the world to be the Redeemer to be the sacrifice for sin, to be able to bring the condemned out of their condemnation and put them upon a path of freedom to life everlasting. The disciples, they weren't concerned about that woman. They were concerned about something to eat. Their focus was not upon that woman. Their focus was upon my needs and what I want right now, isn't it? You know, so much of our lives, that's where our focus is, is it not? I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not trying to be harsh, folks, but I'm trying to be honest. So much of our life is focused upon just living life changing our clothes and going about life like we lived last week and the week before and the week before and the years before. It is not focused upon the spiritual. It's focused upon the, 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 the physical. We do not contemplate the great spiritual battle that is taking place in the world. And it's going on all the time. And people are dying 
in the battle. And the bulk of those people who are dying in the battle are ending up in the graveyard of hell. So many times, so much of Christianity is not thinking about the lostness of men, but we're thinking about the food, something to eat, not missing a meal, going to work, loving our children, taking care of our home, our job, whatever. Yep, that's the, the physical part of life, isn't it? Maybe we don't realize. Maybe we have lost sight. Maybe we don't understand. I don't know in this world. I can't speak for everybody. But God wants us to focus on the spiritual that is the absolute. That's the absolute. To God, that is the most important, significant, utmost concern of his. Because you see, God loves every human being. And God wants to see every human being saved, forgiven, his child. God has sent his son into the world and he wants nothing more but to redeem the lost. He's paid such a price. Jesus was not concerned about physical. He was concerned about spiritual. What did he say in those verses? I have meat to eat that you know not of. Jesus wasn't concerned about getting his lunch or getting his supper, whatever time of the day it might have been. He wasn't, he wasn't concerned about answering the growling stomach, nourishing his physical body. He was concerned about that woman and her relationship to the Father. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16 to 18 that Jesus came to give eternal life. He came to get men released from condemnation. He came to get them out of darkness and bring them into light. He came to tell people in chapter 4, verse 10 of leading people to the living water. In 4, 14 to help people quench their inner thirst. In Luke 19, 10 to seek and to save the lost. Now we look at verses 34 and 35. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. Every day. Every day. You may not even need to go out of your house. And when you step out of your house, there's a harvest. It may be in your home, there's a harvest field. It may be outside. Yes, it is outside too. When you step outside, the whole world from your doorstep is a field ready for harvest. God sent Jesus for that purpose. And God has sent you and I for that purpose. Making a living, loving our spouse, loving our children, enjoying life, going fishing, playing golf, trying to be a, a, a healthier person, trying to help my neighbor. That isn't why we're here. That isn't what it's about for the Christian. Once we name the name of Jesus and identify with him as Lord and learn how we are supposed to live our lives and what we are to do, the Bible teaches that the most significant thing, the most important thing for us as Christians 
is to bring in the harvest. It's to bring in the harvest. God didn't send us to do our will. He has sent us to do his will. He sent Jesus to do his will, the Father's will. And he has called and sent you and I to do the same thing, to do his will. Will not to lose sight of our purpose. Why are we still here? It is not just simply to live life until we die. Oh, that's, I mean, that's just the normal flow, isn't it? But that's not why we're here. That's not why we're still here. Look at verse 34. God expected Jesus to finish his task, and he expects you and I to finish the task. He has given to us. In verse 35, he says, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white and the harvest. The harvest is ready. Lift up your eyes and see. He says in verses 36 to 38, there is sowing and reaping to do. The gospel is to be planted in the hearts and minds of people around us. And in verse 36, he says there is accountability. There is accountability. It takes intentionality, doesn't it? What does it take together in the harvest? What's it take together in the harvest? It takes awareness. Jesus said, lift up your eyes in verse 35. Now, oh, I see the beans out there and I see the corn out there. Jesus said, forget the corn and the beans. See, that's old, and that's old, and that's old, and that's old, and that's old. They're lost and they need to be redeemed. If they don't hear and experience the gospel, they're going to hell. They are already condemned to the lake of fire. Lift up your eyes and see them. See them. Behold the fields, he says, plural. Whether it's the fields of Honeywell and our area, or the fields of our state, or our nation, or our world. It is the same. Lift up your eyes for the fields. The harvest is ripe. Right now. It is already ready. The time is now. That's what he's saying. What happens? What happens if we don't bring in the harvest? The farmer who says, well... You know, I planted my crops and they're ready, but I just don't think I want to go out today. And I don't want to go out tomorrow. You know, maybe I can sit here and just think them into the bin, you know? And as he sits there, pretty soon the stalks, whether it be beans or corn, begins to bend over and then they come to the ground and then they're lost, aren't they? They're lost. And that's what Jesus is saying to, his, to us here. If the harvest isn't reaped, it's lost. If it remains in the field, if it, if it isn't gathered, it's left behind. And it will rot and be lost forever. He's not talking about corn and beans. He's talking about souls. He's talking about people. People that Christians encounter all over the world, day in and day out. People that you and I encounter day in and day out. What does it take to gather the harvest? It takes obedience. In verse 36, he tells us that we are to reap and to gather. In verse 36, he tells us to sow. In verse 37, he tells us to sow and reap. In verse 38, he says, I sent you to reap together in the harvest. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, and be not conformed to this world, 
Oh, so many in the Christian community around the world, we're conformed to the world. We just go to church, we go home, change our clothes, and go on about life. That's the way it is. But Paul, with the inspiration of the Spirit of God, says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. In verse 35, he said to lift up your eyes. That's Jesus speaking. That's a commandment, isn't it? And see the fields. And he said, go forth and harvest. In Luke 10 too, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Why are you and I still here? Why are we still here? It isn't just to go on with normal living life. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Why are we still here? To go into the harvest and to reap the harvest. Hmm. Yes. A sad truth I've learned through the years is that many a Christian doesn't even know how to begin to reap the harvest. We don't know how to tell somebody about Jesus or we're scared to death to tell them about Jesus. Maybe they don't want to hear it. Maybe it'll upset them. Maybe we'll lose a friendship. Lord, I, I just, I can't, I can't speak those words. Lord, I, I don't know what to do. God says all along, trust me. Trust me, I'll help you. I'll be there. Many a Christian, many a Christian doesn't even know what verses to turn to in the word of God to lead somebody to understand what it means to be condemned and to know forgiveness and to come to Christ as Savior and Lord. We don't even know where to start. And I found through the years we taught, we taught Christian witnessing and many, many times, and you know how many people come and participate in it? You can almost count them on one hand because we don't care. We don't, we're not concerned. It just isn't that important to us. My friend, I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly this morning, but you know how many of us have been coming to prayer night, first Sunday night of the month, to pray for our church, to pray for a pastor, to pay that we'll be the people of God. Four people come the last three months. Do we want to grow? Do we want to grow? We don't want to grow. We could get rid of half of the pews back there and just all have the front half. We could sit in the front half. Do we want to stay and be comfortable at 30 people or less? <laughs> We're a lot less this morning. Are we comfortable with that? Is that? Are we acceptable with that? Is that what we want? Is that, a, that all we care about? You and I have family members who are lost. And I'm telling you, as I've told you before, they're going to hell. If they don't come to Jesus, they're going to hell. Our numbers turned in this year said we had 87 people who belong to this church. And we have a hard time getting 30 of them into church. Something's wrong, folks. Something's wrong. I came to you 
I'm not patting my back. Don't, don't, don't say I'm patting my back this morning because I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I am not perfect. But we came and began to talk about a vision. And we put some things together. And now we're, we're trying to work those things in. Why? So that we might grow. So that we might grow. Because there are people out there who are lost. Oh, my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, my neighbor. They tell me they're a Christian. Listen, folks, don't come and don't cry your tears to me. If they're not committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then they need to search their heart and see if they really know what it means to be a Christian. If I haven't got time to come to God's house, the Bible says that's where I need to be. If I haven't got time to live for Jesus and talk like a Christian and live like a Christian, there's something wrong. So much of the world that professes to be Christian doesn't live it according to the statistics. What are the benefits of being a, a reaper? What are the benefits of gathering in the harvest? There are benefits, you know. There are benefits. What's in it for me? That's what we might want to ask ourselves. That's what so much of the world wants to ask. What's in it for me? Jesus said in verse 36, receiveth wages. What wages are we going to receive? Well, there is accountability. He says we will be rewarded rather than disciplined. I'm a firm believer that when we stand before the Lord and he says, how have you fulfilled my, my commandment to go ye forth and bring the lost in, gather in the harvest? I'm a firm believer that he's going to say what we've actually done. And if we haven't done anything, if we haven't done enough, if we've just gone through the motions of being Christian, Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 part of the rewards is when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. For those who go out and gather in the harvest and for those who live and walk in the Christ-like way. In verse 36, he said, we can rejoice together with other believers. If you witness to someone and you come and share that with the rest of us, we can rejoice with you because you've done what God says we're supposed to do. If you talk to them about Jesus and they've received the Lord, we haven't won them. The Spirit of God has brought them into the kingdom of God. But we can rejoice together, can we not? In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says we are laborers together. With, we have the privilege we have the privilege of working with God. We are laborers together with God. We have a privilege. And we have the satisfaction of knowing that we have served God as He commanded. We've been obedient. We've strived to please Him, to honor Him, to do what He's told us to do. Verse 29, the woman came, and what happened when she came? She found the truth, and she opened her heart and came to the knowledge of the salvation of God. In verse 39, the Bible says many believed. In verse 41, it says many more believed. I don't 
how long I'm going to be with you. But as long as I'm with you, I have a vision, folks. And I believe that what God wants us to do is to have his vision. Not to have a half-empty church, but to have a full church. And the preacher isn't going to make it happen. We as the people of God, working together, make it happen. Gather the harvest. Gather the harvest. Preacher, you've been rough on me this morning. Sorry, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to put a burden on you. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm not trying to upset you. I'm not trying to send you home aggravated with the preacher. I'm saying to you folks, look around. Look around. God says the harvest is ripe. Go forth and gather in my harvest. Above every reason, everything else for which you and I are still living and walking upon this earth, that is our foremost task above everything else. Nothing else matters more to God than that. That's why we're still here. Yes, we need to love our spouses. Yes, we need to love our children. Yes, we need, to, we need to make a living. Yes, we need to live a good life. Yes, we need to do this. Yes, we need to do that. But first and foremost, God says there's a world out there that's ripe for harvest. And it's time to reap. It's time to reap. Let's join together. When we talk to people, find a way. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Are you going to church anywhere? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? What do you think about heaven and hell? Do you believe in God? Are you planning? Are you planning to go to heaven when you die? There are lots of ways to engage a person. Let's gather in the harvest. Father, let's stand together. Father, we come to the house of the Lord this morning. We've opened your word. And we pray that you've been the one that's spoken to us. I pray, God. I pray that we'll be harvested. that we will sense the, the real, absolute doom of lost people ending up in hell. Oh, our children say they love the Lord. Oh, my wife, my husband, my, my parents say they love the Lord. Oh, people tell me they know the Lord. God, there's a field that's ripe unto harvest. White unto harvest. And we must, we must go forth. We must help people to understand that empty words are worthless. You didn't call us just to talk the talk. You called us to walk the walk. Help us to see those people around us. That the harvest truly is ripe and ready to be gathered. We close this service this morning, Father, with that in mind. And we ask
ask for your help and your guidance and your leading and your empowerment. Help us to bring a vision, Father, your vision for this church to fulfillment and reality in Jesus' name. Amen.